on this week's Rockstar Superhero. This week on the show, we break some serious new ground. It's not often we are afforded a chat with musical royalty, but today, indeed we are. Bassist Steve McDonald started his professional music career at a very young age. Within a few years, he and his brother Jeff started the seminal power pop band Red Cross, and less than 10 years later played The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. 30 years on, Steve is still killing it, standing in the ceremonial center, providing ground support for the legendary sludge metal band The Melvins. Their new album, Bad Mood Rising, is a mix of all the things the Melvins do so well, and they don't mind letting you have it, square in your ear hole. Make sure you pick up the new record as soon as you listen to our super fun chat. Don't just stream it, buy it, then go see the band on tour. It will blow your mind. This is my chat with Steve McDonald of the Melvins, and you're listening to Rockstar Superhero. It's rare that I have somebody like you on the show. Um, obviously, I'm I'm very very fortunate to know a lot of great PR guys. Uh, talk to a lot of you know bands over the years. People I've been influenced by, people I'm fascinated with. Um, but it's really rare for me to talk to somebody that is in the same age range that has I believe has had the same sort of experiences growing up. The only thing different I think is is that you did something with them and I ended up uh, <laughs> doing a podcast 40 years later. But, uh, you know, I, I thank you so much for being here, Stephen. I, I I love what you do in the Melvins. I love what you do in Red Cross. And um, I love your sense of humor, your style on stage. I just wanted to make that clear before we get going here. <laughs> Okay. Well, yeah. uh, geez, I'm humbled. Uh, well, uh, uh, compliments accepted. It's yeah. very clear. And I really appreciate that. Thank you yeah. for the encouragement. Well, yeah. Uh, I, and the identification. <laughs> well, you know, anybody who crosses their eyes perpetually on stage well, wins everything <laughs> in my book. So so you've got it down. Uh. It's yeah, it's so funny. I see I see reflections of my childhood in you. I think that's what it is. And um, mm. I was born in 66. I think okay. you were born in 67. Is that correct? This is true. Yeah. Yeah. And what, so what, what month were you born? September. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I am not <laughs> balanced at all. I, this idea of the Libra and this idea of balance, I'm the most uh, eccentric out there. Uh, okay. Wacko there is. So, <laughs> um, but you know what it is? It's, it's, the music, and I, and I, I don't want to just obviously talk about Red Cross today. I mean, we're here to promote the new Mel- Melvin's record. Yeah. But, you know, I have to say that the Red Cross thing is, um, I think, is probably why I feel like I do identify with you personally. Because, oh, okay. Yeah. The, the, the kiss thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so was, was that an early, um, did they stamp? their um presence on you at an early at an early stage yeah yeah well i mean in 1974 my parents uh, so i'm a drummer and, and oh, got it yeah 1974 for christmas my parents started buying me records uh, yeah. as as christmas presents and that's so nice yeah yeah it was really great they were very encouraging they bought me a really great ludwig vista light kit back uh in 74 Back when they first came out. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You were yeah. really young. That's amazing. I was. Yeah. Yeah. I started playing when I was seven. Wow. Um, and you had a Vista Light kit within around that time? Yeah. Damn. Crazy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I take it your parents are musicians as well, maybe. My my mom. My mom was, uh, and she's still alive, uh, and a fantastic singer. So they really oh, saw it in great. me. They, yeah, they encouraged me, which was which was really wonderful. Part of it, I, I think I was first born and not to say that they favored me over my brother or anything, but they just saw that I was heavily ambitious, you know, was driven to music at a very young age. Yeah. Well, right? that's great. That yeah. if it 
to to have to have any kind of direction like that at such a young age is rare and it's great if a parent can support that that's cool yeah yeah so i was listening to the hudson brothers and bay city uh -huh. rollers and elo and sure. cheap trick and then we went to spokane one weekend and they said hey you gotta buy a couple of new records and i bought the new uh kiss record destroyer oh wow cool which, which changed my life of course yeah right you right. know yeah. i wasn't so much into uh detroit rock city i was more into you know kings of the nighttime world and oh, yeah. right right uh i i just love that kind of i love the b-sides so much well that's the kim fowley influence maybe i think he wrote on that song yeah <laughs> or whatever uh you really like my limousine <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like the way the yeah. wheels roll. roll. Yeah, that's right. The, you like the was it Costa or F Studio or whatever? I can't remember what the words are. All of a sudden, and my oh seven God. inch leather yeah. heels. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, oh my God! So there's some really funny lyrics in that song. There's one about uh, you like the credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were clearly money obsessed even yeah. back then. <laughs> The credit cards. That's amazing. Oh, uh, yeah. But I, you know, there was just something about that sound, the feeling. This is what this show's about. It's about the feeling of music. It's not about identifying influence as much as it is identifying a feeling. And, mm -hmm. and, what the Melvins have created, what, what Red Cross created, what so many bands have created that have been hidden in the seams is this is this feeling that they identify with a period of our lives. And that's what sort of motivates us to move on, right? That's why we listen to something. And like we listen to Oh Holy Night and we think of Christmas, but we also think of a time we heard it the first time and we cry because it's our when our grandparents were alive. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, sure. so that's what you've done to me, man. Okay. <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's you're awesome. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I definitely have the Kiss thing in common with the Melvins guys as well. Like yeah. that was um, a touchstone when I started playing with them because, um, you know, they're um, they've leaned more into metal stuff than I, than I did, like past a certain era. Right. Um, but definitely. Kiss and that particular sweet spot you were talking about is um, was always um, very comfortable common ground between us. And um, and when I first started playing with them, I purposely got um, a Gene Simmons. Well, not uh, I, I bass the Gene used to play that I always wanted. I, I went out and got myself. It was like that's always a thing for me when I start playing in a band. I I use it as an excuse to um, are one of the things one of the one of the perks I allow myself with the indulgence is to get a new guitar nice. and, and what, and which um, are bass, you know? And so I got a, a Gibson uh, grabber, which is the kind of thing I would stare at uh, the pictures on the inside of the first alive and look at the gear and on yeah. the back cover, it says kiss use Gibson guitars and Pearl drums because they want the best. And, right. and I've held on to that special valuing of those particular like above other things that have you know that are probably just as quality or higher there's still this certain status or prestige attached to um that first those those instruments because they're related to that first moment of discovery i guess yeah and uh, they really yeah. take me back to that feeling of wonder yeah, you know, uh, Kansas uh, put out an album, two for the show, in 1978 uh -huh. that, that affected me the same way. And it's funny, it's something about liner notes. You know, when you're a kid, you sit yeah. down with a record, you know, you put it on the record player. I had my drum set over here and headphones so I could play along with records, right? That's and, right. And, uh, you know, I would sit and read the liner notes because I really wanted to know, I wanted to... Um, sort of endorse the music, if, if you will. And I remember reading the, the notes saying, um, you know, this album is dedicated to a kid that lost his sight and the last last thing he ever saw was a Kansas show. Oh, my you, God. You know, you oh. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, that, and yeah, I remember that. Uh, it's funny. You quoted it. I didn't recall it until now, but I do remember that on the back of the, of the Kiss Alive record. 
Um, uh, although um, I was obsessed with Kiss Alive too because you know yeah. the uh, the lion thing that Peter had on the the, yeah. the mural that held his you know and that that hid the the floating part of the drum set. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, totally. Yeah, it's a big scrim or whatever that reveals itself as 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 the. Uh, <laughs> Drum yeah. platform yeah. elevates. Yeah. And, oh and they've got the two stairs on the side of each. And <laughs> Yeah. I want to be 12 again. I want to be yeah. 12 again, you know, <laughs> when, when there was hope. <laughs> well, it's funny. Melvin's got to, um, they, uh, before I was playing with them, quite a while before I was playing with them, they're, they got the, the very lucky, um, you know, uh, the very sweet support slot of uh, supporting Kiss on their reunion, their first oh reunion God. tour. And they were using that Kiss Alive 2 staging, all that stuff they brought back out for that first uh, oh. um, reunion tour. And so they, they, they got to see behind the scenes uh, the making wow. of that era. But um, yeah, I feel you on whatever. I, I love it. I love the fantasy. And it's amazing yeah. when the fantasy is, um, you know, it's fun to have grown up with it and to see what's come of things. And and it's always, there's always weird surprises. Like um, recently I was seeing, I saw on Instagram or whatever, on social media, um, a friend of mine that's a, that's a journalist, Lindsay Parker, um, she was interviewing Gene Simmons in uh, a, uh, like a sports bar in El Segundo, California. And the sports bar is um, owned by him and Paul. It's called uh, Rock and Brews. And <laughs> okay. uh, it's a small chain of sports bars that they own. They're kind of like uh, kind of like Hard Rock Cafe where they insert Gene and Paul's image amongst, you know, Jimi Hendrix and <laughs> yeah, the Pantheon. <laughs> but it's fair. But right. It's funny. And, uh, um, but it, they um one of their restaurants is in El Segundo, which is the town, this the neighboring town to where I grew up, <laughs> and uh, the neighboring town to where I grew up. And it's just so funny seeing her in my friend Lindsay in El Segundo hanging out with Gene Simmons in a spot where I would have I can imagine myself as a 12 year old or younger, even like barefoot walking across that piece of land <laughs> yeah and uh and and you know with a skateboard in my hand and um thinking about going to the kiss concert or having gone to the kiss concert and uh and and now 40 years later whatever it is and um and gene owns a sports bar and he's still over he's still gene simmons he's still a rock star and yeah um you know, but it just, it's just neat. I, I don't know. I just think it's funny. Like, you never know what's going to happen. And um, it keeps me um, interested and curious about the next, um, I don't know, page turn or whatever metaphor you want to use. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we could literally talk about this the entire time because I, yeah, there's something about the old days when the land was undeveloped. I mean, look. You and I, I know this is true right now. I know right now, if you close your eyes and you remember those times, you can smell it. It's, it's <laughs> it goes right. It goes way deeper than just visualizing what you, you know, you're, you're recalling what you remember about that time, but you can smell that time. And right. I mean, well, I, I, you can. <laughs> I will. Uh, Los Angeles in the seventies was a pretty smoggy place. True. Uh, yeah. True. But um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, definitely a sense memory. I, I am susceptible to all sorts of uh, triggers uh, that can take me to a place, you know, taste and, you know, or, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I can, um, I can recall these things. I like to, I like to reminisce and, indulge nostalgia but you know at the same time it's like like i was just saying and like i it made i like the wonderment of of seeing how things turned out and like wow you would never would have guessed that and then like oh so i wonder what's you know around the corner and um it, it's it's neat that way I, I i guess yeah just to shift it into like it still it makes it fun to um, rather than only considering what was, but also enthusiasm for what is coming. Right. And, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, look, 
It's that's completely fair. I mean, look, you're here to talk about the new record, Melba's <laughs> record, B- Bad Mood Rising. Um, I I listened to it a lot over the last uh, three or four days. I want to say it's been three or four days that I've been really listening to it. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would describe it as a wild, heavy, dissonant piece of esoteric art. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's super dangerous. Yeah. You know what I, you know what I mean? And I, I have to say, I, I wish I had the balls as a kid or as an adult to play music like this. And I, w- I was thinking about the Melvin's discography and the sort of relentlessness to it. You know, the nature of it is always <laughs> changing and breaking the rules and never settling into a genre or looking for popularity. And it's it's almost like they're thumbing their nose, and when I say they, I have to obviously include you. It's it it's it really is it is pushing back against everything that anybody would say is popular in a way, and at the same time, it's successful and it builds the legend of the band because this stuff will live forever, man. You know, it just is. And I and I guess my first question to you today would be, how does it feel to be a part of that? Because you've changed the way the Melvins behave, sound, and feel. It's new now. Mm. It's 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 bigger and better than ever in my book. And I'm not saying that because you're here. I, I really believe that. Oh. Well, that's nice of you to say. I mean, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I definitely didn't walk into anything with an intention to affect change in their world. There's nothing broken, in my opinion, or needing to uh, accommodate from my comfort zone or anything. Sure. I think, um, uh, you know, I mean, really for me, it's real, I kind of came into it with like an open heart and open mind. And because it's intimidating to step into an, you know, an institution that is, yeah. has, um, uh, you know, as a, a loyal, obs, obsessive, even fan base, and and you know this um, and uh, this history of great musicians having done the same role, and so you know that's always um, challenging to to define your place in it, and but be yourself at the same time, and um, and not just conform to this strong identity. And, um, I don't know that, um, I naturally like they're, they're always pushing back against the mainstream. That seems to be Buzz's sort of, um, comfort spot. That's his Mm -hmm. default is to question, uh, common knowledge or what's thought of as common knowledge or common sense or whatever. And he's real, I guess, Socratic that way. Really. It's always, Oh really? Why is that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, um, which you know is, I guess, is a bit of a contrarian point of view. But whatever, like that's a. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't. I don't want to label necessarily. Just that it's just very much himself. Very indi- Very a, an individual, and um, um, and that's uh, you know. There's something very. Uh, there's something, you know, both exciting and and um, attractive and challenging about those things. Yeah. And I always find myself attracted to it. Like my brother, I think, shares those qualities and similar. And they change too, you know, as a person gets older. And um, but you know, so I find myself sometimes if I see like the Melvins, if I think of them as a group in the bigger picture of the music world community or the the world in general, pushing back, then I find myself in their little world pushing back. (laughs) Yeah. That's all. I don't know. I don't know how all that works and whatever, but maybe there is, maybe some of that's coming through. I have no idea. I definitely not. I think I'm just trying to be myself in it. And, um, but I mean, this is all still kind of um, sounds like psycho babble, probably, and it's behind the scenes stuff too. But um, you know, I don't know. It's just an interesting thing of being a part of something that has such a formed, established identity. Um, you know, it's like being in several tribes at once, and, right? And how do you how do you commit entirely to a tribe, and then being another tribe, and um, 
and I think that's a healthy thing ultimately, you know, um, it's, it's wasn't, it's, but it's not always easy to do. And when you think of these, I mean, I guess a tribe is a way to describe many different groups that we inhabit. Um, that's a word that gets used a lot nowadays, I guess, in, sure. pop, in popular culture, but, um, but it, bands are that for sure. You know, bands have their own set of, um, values and belief systems and they're they're generally exist because it's our way of like giving the bird to the the bigger system the outside world and and the more the more you know uh, resource your group can garner for its members the more success you have the, the more you don't have to deal with the outside world's totally rules and regulations and um so it's a neat thing, but then it's very it's very rare to be in those little those little closed systems, and then be in multiple versions of that. And sometimes they agree with each other, and sometimes they don't. And, right. Uh, and so it's you know I don't know I I'm speaking like a I don't know maybe I think I'm some kind of anthropo anthrop anthrop <laughs> anthropologist or something or but uh uh. <laughs> I don't know. See, I don't even know. I'm just living it. I'm always looking for the right words to describe my experience. And I think it's people in, acad in ac academia or whatever that study these, but they're, it's more about actual tribes and Micronesia. So I don't know. But um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I relate, I find myself relating to these stories, you know. And uh, yeah. So anyways, that was a very long winded uh, pontification on your <laughs> simple question about uh, have I affected the sound of the Melvins? I I don't know, but um, oh, you have. Yeah, uh, well, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. well, I mean, I take that. I mean, I'll take that as a compliment. Coming that I really liked the new record. I had fun making it, and um, you know, Buzz and I start. We went off to um, during the pandemic. We went um, out of town and made some demos, and that's how this record started. And um, on the same laptop, actually, that I'm talking to you on is how this record started. Nice. I should I should come over and touch it so I can see. This. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but they have the camera on this. Also, watched uh, Buzz and I start the new uh, Bad Mood Rising record. Oh, uh, um, and but it was a good. It was good for me. It was really more me just capturing Buzz's. Um, because he had a lot of ideas already in there. And he was open to, if I had, if I bring in anything to the table, but um, it was good for me to get some footing and in, um, in the songs before we started recording, because is what he, what comes out of him naturally is not necessarily all that intuitive for your average player. He has a strange way of counting bars and counting mm. beats in bars and, I rather he doesn't count them at all. He just feels them, okay. and then when I'm like, "Wait, I have what? How do you count that?" Because I suddenly we're on an odd number, right? And, and I'm if I don't know what's going on, I'm next. I'm playing like an umpa beat, and I'm <laughs> accenting the upbeat and everything. And, and it's because suddenly there was a bar of five thrown in there that I didn't know about, and, right? And he doesn't know to tell me that it's oh. Oh no! I, I, it goes to odd number here. I you know, and so it was good for me to lay it all out because I recorded him on Pro Tools with a click track too. <laughs> but then I could see the measures like, oh, he's no longer on the downbeat now. But what happened? Oh, there's a bar of three thrown in there, and right. and oh, okay, and because I don't always necessarily hear it, I'm always like. How are you? I would say to Dale, like, where the fuck is one? How did you find one? <laughs> you got to know the song. You just got to yeah. know the song. Yeah. But Dale's really good. I mean, he's really good at, um, because he can speak both languages. He can speak the, the caveman. Uh, I mean, I don't mean this in any kind of, um, I don't think that I am superior in any way. Does it? Buzz is very, like, he just feels it. He doesn't know. He doesn't know how to break it. He doesn't know how to analyze it. And, and break it down into other into terms of measures and beats per measure, uh, and and I just need that because I'm I'm following. <laughs> and so right. I, I'm like, yeah, and I've learned that language just to communicate with other musicians, like a little bit, just enough. And Dale is really good at um, 
he can speak that language as well, but he also just speaks this, uh, but he's also good at just reading Buzz's mind and knowing how, um, how, when and how to turn the beat around. It's, and it's really, it's really, um, it's become very uh, seamless between right. the two of them. So that was also interesting to find my space in between this system that is so seamlessly connected. They're like, um, twins you know still connected by a cord or something yeah well i mean you know you you saying that reminds me of like onions makes the milk taste bad right it, uh, it, sure it, it's that that opening sequence that's clearly not in four <laughs> and yeah. and and right there's those twists in it and yet yeah intuitively it makes sense and it's just it's just like anything i think most musicians of course i don't want to i don't actually this is an unfair thing to say but i think most musicians really do even even if they're highly educated play by feel it's not necessarily by the expectation that you know bach would have written it this way so therefore we have to follow music theory right it's yeah. it's it's more about that twist works because it works and you you need to learn it because it vibes that way yeah you know um i think that it's you know i mean it's great when there's things that are unexpected it's i love it when you don't hear it as um, it, that it was just came out of someone naturally. It should, to me, I don't know what to say, I don't know what should. There's no right or wrong way, but I like it best when you don't even notice it. And that is because it's so seamless. I mean, the only, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not into theory in terms of like knowing what the rules are to then obey them. Mm -hmm. I like, I just like having command of the language for, in, for communication sense, because I'm always in playing in bands with other people. And, um, you know, I like, um, it's amazing when you can communicate, it's amazing when you can c communicate telepathically, but often telepathy will fail. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. and uh, so it's great when you have the command of any, any kind of language that will communicate what it is you're trying to get across. You know, yeah. some people are just super, some people can just read your mind and sometimes I can read people's minds and that's a beautiful place when you're in that zone. But um, you know, but it's I can't um, always rely on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, eye contact obviously takes you a long ways, but it doesn't necessarily yeah. dictate where you're going with the cord. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Where's, what's what's this inversion like? Oh, I don't know. Just read my mind, and you'll yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I I don't want to necessarily talk too much about the complexities of the record, but. You know, the first track alone, um, uh, uh, I believe the title is Mr. Dog is Totally Right. I think. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Is, Dog is Totally Right. Totally, I'm telling you. Uh -huh. But so so for listeners, first of all, check out the record. Unbelievable. But the first track alone does something I've never heard the Melvins do. And, and, and this could be because you're here and I'm in a little bit of a star fucking mood. <laughs> but, but there's this... Um, there's this harmonic edge to it. The the way the chords work, um, it, I've never heard it that way. And it's why I said what I said before. Your voice, meaning your your you know your physical, your speaking, your singing voice, okay, has changed the way the band sounds. The 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 the, the timbre of the music has changed because you're a part of it. And I get it. You've been in the band for for quite a while now. But I'm wondering, how much were you encouraged to sort of do whatever you want? Because you know, I watch you on stage, I watch you in live performances, you know, the, that bus performance, for example. And when you're playing, you're dancing around on stage, you're being silly and goofy, and you're having fun. Um, you're bringing this, you know, the Stevenisms. But, you know, how much do you have autonomy in the sense of being you? You know, do you feel the, the, the compulsion to be a part of the Melvins or are you just being Steven? Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, uh, well, they're very encouraging. Um, their, their whole trip is about, um, um, yeah, it's never, there never have been like, Oh, you know, um, 
listen to the record before we play this song and don't forget this hook. I'm always, if anything more, I'm like, tell me what the, tell me, tell me, I don't want to mess. I don't want to miss a part that, um, that people love it for, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to miss that. And they're more like, just do your thing, do, do, do your thing. But at the same time, I always feel, um, at times like, um, you know, like, uh, like the, uh, at the most, the most direction that they've ever given me, the buzz ever gave me really was uh, uh, early on in an early rehearsal. He, they played me one of these famous videos. It's like, uh, it was like a promo clip of the who doing, um, won't get fooled again in the, in the recording studio. And, um, John whistle's got that crazy explorer based with the flying V head stock. And yeah. Uh, and he's got a, you know, amazing killer seventies arena rock bass sound. And, yeah. um, using those sun amps. Yeah. Or something. And he's just like playing the fucking shit out of this fancy, you know, wood carved bass. And, um, uh, and Buzz like we like that. <laughs> be, be him. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, oh, you mean like the master? Yeah. Uh, be the master. Oh, and um, you know, and um, and he's doing all these crazy thrills, trills, and um, and he's also, I mean, and then I'm always quick to go, yeah, but look, he's he's playing over three chords. He's going crazy, but the the it's three chords that. Um, that Pete Townsend's laying out, da -da, da -da, you know, right. It's, and in there, it's in a really simple harmonic box. And um, so he's really free to just improv and go wherever he wants without, um, without, without it, without hitting too many, um, you know, uh, having, you know, crashing into the other, you know, in an unpleasant way. And um, mm. so I always feel like, um, I, and then, then when what Buzz delivers me is rarely three chords. It's usually a very complicated riff that goes on for two and a half bars before, right. it, repeat, before it repeats, <laughs> yeah. uh, if it does repeat. <laughs> right. And uh, I'm like, I'd love to be in Whistle on top of that. I'd love to be, it won't get fooled again around top of that, but it's like, I'm not sure. I at first I got to remember. The first I got to learn what you're doing, and then uh, so I'm always trying to find that zone. I'm I guess I'm always wondering, like, um, you know, uh, uh, am I um, being flashy enough? And then is it just annoying? You know, like, or uh, so that would be the 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 um, uh, you know the internal dialogue conflict that I'm wrestling with. That hopefully. I'm letting you behind the scrim right now. The yeah, screen. yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, hopefully, it just looks up. You know, the idea is that it looks like it's all coming out naturally. And uh, but um, you know, I don't know. I I'm I think I'm always looking for that that spot of where um, and you know, and also I think about like I was listening to Pete Townsend's book audio book a little while ago. I never read his book and I just mm. started listening to it. And, um, and, you know, and he's just, you know, or he says this in the interviews a lot too about how it was all um, just what a, uh, you know, how much space he was taking up and how that was, um, you know, how dedicated he was to that role of, um, you know, being just, trying to cover this huge harmonic i mean townsend he's talks time about keeper. yeah well townsend's the timekeeper because he's got the, the he's got his rhythm section is so busy but then they're also creating uh, and john at whistle is creating lots of different sort of tonal like for a bass player it's outrageous it's more like a piano player mm -hmm. like what he's doing and um just the harmonics, I guess, is the term, the, the word that um, that Townsend talks about it. And, you know, so at any rate, I mean, I, I can't compare to the. I think all I really want, all it makes me really want to do is just like get on YouTube and learn as many of these, um, you know, learn as many of these um, triplet tricks and stuff that uh, to the, uh, 
the end whistle's doing or even just learn the bass solo and my generation and then i'll go on youtube and i'll see like some nine-year-old kid <laughs> right, killing from it. japan <laughs> yeah just fucking killing it and i'll be like and i'll be like oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I why didn't that. i i should have figured that out a long time ago well, look at me i'm such an underachiever yeah i'll just be stephen mcdonald <laughs> yeah like, well, i guess it's okay what i do yeah it is it is you know i mean look me being a drummer the first thing I do, I can't help it. The first thing I do is I lock into what the bass player is doing. I'm listening to that. I'm listening to the tonality, right? I'm listening to the approach. I'm listening to the space between notes. Is you know, are they overplaying? Are they underplaying? Are they playing right for the song? Mm. And I again, I don't want to continue to praise you too much, although maybe you appreciate it. I what I've loved about you from the olden days to today is is that you bring a um, I don't want to be obvious here, but you do bring a McCartney-esque sort of vibe to what you do. And I think it's because you wisely play for the song. You know, there's so much going on around you. I mean, with Dale, obviously, you know, his drumming style um, is, um, I mean, he's he's playing almost lyrically. Right. As a yeah. drummer. And 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 so so you are sort of. I don't want to say left, but you know what I mean? You're sort of suspended off to the side to be this guy that connects those, connects the the melodic to the rhythmic. And and uh, again, which is the bass's job. But I don't know, man. I, I think, you know, I listen to that and I say like, okay, here's a guy who's really, really, truly playing for the song and, and just in there, as you know, Kurt Hammett would say, and I think that really, really matters. And again, I'm sorry for heaping so much embarrassing <laughs> praise on you, Stephen. But, but yeah, there's that is what makes the band click in a way I don't think it ever has. And yeah. I guess, I mean, if I can ask, I, I hate asking the, the influence question, but let me ask it this way. What do you think originally attracted you to the bass? You know, I mean, why why did you pick that instrument, and and who do you see in your playing? <laughs> well, the reason I played the bass is because my gene? brother. My, no, well, well, no, it's because my brother already chose guitar. Gotcha, gotcha. You <laughs> do then, that, yeah, yeah. Well, that, well, kind of because we had to come up with a plan of how we were going to get electric guitar. Like we weren't as lucky to have parents that just gave us a Vista Light kit at eight years old. Mom, Stephen means nothing negative by this. <laughs> <laughs> No, but actually, my parents were extremely supportive, and we were actually really lucky. But, but, um, but we, but they really wanted to be um, shown that it was we were um, worthy of their investment. But I still have my. Um, actually, hang on for one second. Yeah, no worries. I'll make a note to edit this part. Oh no, I don't have to edit it. That's the best. Oh, look at you go. Oh uh, my god, um, just the light. Uh, I still have my um, 1978 or 77 oh God, um, fin Fender Music Master. This is the same bass that okay, I got. I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move you. I'm gonna move you in and solo you, Stephen, so <laughs> people can see this. Because wow, yeah. look at that! Oh my it's God, it's my 1970, 77, I think. Um, music wow. Master bass, but um, with <laughs> and it got modified before I even got it with a. Um, Demarcio pickup, which nowadays people are bummed about, but the, wow. they upheld my parents. <laughs> it was very nice of them. They, they, they at any rate, um, yeah. but I, I got that bass because I joined the school orchestra and I learned how to play it on the stand up a couple of bass lines. And then my parents were like, well, well, you know, and then my brother and I started in on them, like, please get him a bass, get him an electric bass. And, um, uh, but say it was after that, it was really after that when I started hearing the bass from playing it, like, um, then, because it's a very, because other, you know, the untrained ear, you don't even kind of realize that there's this other instrument going on that's not the guitar soloing instrument. And, um, and yeah, and, and then that's the first things you kind of really hear as a rock fan, you start noticing the bass lines of Paul, for me, I started noticing the bass lines of Paul McCartney, which are just so, you know, they're especially past a certain era, past um, from like uh, 
revolver on or even re uh, rubber saw a little bit, but from 66 kind yeah. of on, yeah. the bass just gets so prevalent that it's such a lead instrument and um, the melodies. I think it's really when Paul started change the way they recorded and like he would go back and and redo the bass line without playing without singing because prior to that they're you know they only they're recording on four tracks and they're always playing and singing at the same time mm -hmm. and so the bass line would stay boom da -dum, ba -dum, stay, right. stay simpler as he's doing you know whatever but then um but then they got inspired and they figured out techn technically how to go back and make space to do the basses and overdrive. And, um, and yeah, at any rate, but um, so the, yeah, there's that. And, and then Gene Simmons is the first bass player I saw play live. I saw Kiss in 76. And oh my God. Did you see So you saw the tour with the, uh, the, I remember the poster with Peter Chris playing the drum and, and Ace, I think had a fife. Do you, do you know what I'm talking uh, uh, about? The, the uh, 1776? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, so actually I saw them right before that. Like when oh I, when the first time I saw them, I missed, cause that tour, you're talking about destroyer tour. And, um, when first time I saw Kiss, they were still touring on Kiss Al the first Alive. Oh wow! On like Deuce, and it was right. they were kind of doing their victory lap. Um, the record was now a bona fide hit, and I saw them in I think so the internet. I can look these things up now. I I saw them in February of 1976. Wow! And um, they were doing all of Kiss Alive, and. Um, I was eight years old and my brother and his teenage friends took me, but, um, uh, wow. but then, but then, yeah, then later that summer they came back through with the, the then released destroyer album. And that's when, uh, then, then they had gone from playing arenas to stadiums. And, um, but I missed that tour. I was, um, our family had gone on family vacation to, um, back to back east to see my relatives and um so i missed that tour but um but then i saw the next tour um the kiss alive 2 tour the ones with the um the cats the, the thing you were describing and yeah yeah the stairs and cheap trick opened for that concert but um oh, at any rate God. but speaking of bass players that's another yes. influence yeah and but you know oh, but the, uh but Gene, you know, so Paul is this really melodic and bouncy. He plays like a tuba almost, like a tuba part. Mm -hmm. And then Gene is down, like all these big, uh, these big flashy. I guess he's sort of taking it from Entwistle a bit. And then he's adding, adding a, a, a theatricality to it. You know, he, he would talk about, uh, um, oh, uh, like Japanese theater and which is sort yeah, of like kabuki yeah yeah kabuki theater and comic books and stuff and um and you know and like i really had related to that that really pulled me in the theatricality of it and you know so all that that's you know so i mean that's that's the thing is like for me um playing is is was more performance um motivated in a lot of ways and you know, we're here talking about a record, or I'm just talking about whatever. But, well, that's uh, what the point of the show is, is to talk okay, about whatever. Okay, so. okay. okay. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, records have been a challenge for me. I mean, I've, I, you know, I grew up with albums. I love them. Um, but recording studio is, um, can be a difficult place. And um, the tendency to get into perfectionism or just get discouraged because you're hearing things back and it doesn't necessarily what you, the way you intended it, or you're not used to hearing things so naked. And it, that's a whole art into itself too, you know, right. um, learning how to do that well, making records. And um, cause I was so, yeah, I think I just was so locked into that fantasy of like the live show and records were almost like something I had to do just to get myself back up on stage, yeah, you know, yeah. get it done. And, um, and in some ways it's still kind of like that, but I'm trying to get to a different place with it. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I don't want to go too far off to the side here, but I do want to ask one, one question about the uh, red cross experience, which yeah. was when you guys were on the tonight show. Okay. Um, because, 
I can't imagine that. I mean, I I've never been on the I've been on the Today Show, <laughs> oh, yeah, but man. but not but not like you know. I mean, it's not the same thing. Uh, anyway, but point being is is that you were on the Tonight Show, um, you know, early Jay's heyday, that sort of thing, and yeah. that had to be a crazy experience. A lot like you know, skydiving with an anvil in your backpack. You know what I mean? And and so I wonder, you know, most musicians. Do what you just said. They they sort of write songs so they can get back out on the road because their pleasure is performing for others. That's where the beauty of the experience of being a musician is. It's about making people happy and making yourself happy. You know what? What was that like being on that show? Was it the "I've made it" moment, or you know what was, what was it <laughs> uh, like? Oh, I I don't know. I can't. I, I mean, I for me it was probably it was very surreal, and mm. um, I. It was. It came off well. Um, I remember we played well, um, mm -hmm. but there was probably a lot of butterflies prior. And it's a very foreign kind of environment. It's more like a recording studio situation where suddenly, um, like recording studios are so weird because the bands are playing in a garage for all these years, and and you get used to that sound, and then all of a sudden, okay, now we're gonna go. Now we're gonna go capture this for. Um, right. For, you know, for you know, for history's sake, and it's, it's, this is this is going to live forever. I'm going to be really comfortable. Oh wait, hang on. Put these headphones on. <laughs> what? Oh okay, yeah, but as long as I'm next to my amp. Oh no, no, the amp's going in the other room. Right. What? What? <laughs> You're going to isolate you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have to do that, or it's um, it bleeds and bleeding. What's that? You know, and um, and suddenly you're doing something that is um. There's so much, there's so much riding on it for you <laughs> and so much is built up to this and led to this moment. And now we're going to, you know, cover your face and, uh, and tie your hands. And it almost feels like that. Like suddenly you're being forced to perform in a really foreign, uncomfortable <laughs> way. And, um, uh, yeah. So with the Lena thing, I remember the monitors were crazy and I remember the lights are really bright and you can't see the studio audience. And yeah, I felt like I was in like a weird little vacuum, mm. you know? Um, yeah. But I think that's, if I did that a lot, I would get very used to that and, sure. uh, and whatever. And watching it now, you know, all the, um, we were road tested at that point, you know, right. we've been on the road all year long. So it was, you know, it's it's the muscle memory kicks in, and that's why, um, you know, classical soloists like practice eight hours or more a day because, you know, you need to get to a place where it doesn't matter what's going on. There could be, you know, World War Three breaks out around you, and you still don't miss a note, and um, and you know how to um, deal with your internal chaos. And just keep moving forward, and all those things that have been at play. Um, but you know, for me, um, I used to remember that day was. It's also kind of neat just to go, you know, have lunch in the commissary at NBC, right? And um, and then go, you know, you'd shoot it in the daytime, and then you could watch it in your own living room when it airs, and crazy merv griffin was one of the guests oh my god <laughs> yeah it was so it was a really crazy uh bizarre but also we're la family we're la band so um we at least had that comfort of like it was in burbank a place where i you know had been to it's where I'm, nowadays that's where my ikea is yeah <laughs> yeah so i don't know what my reference would have been then but it was like it wasn't a foreign land it was uh so you know, sure. it's just it was just, it's, but 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 it was just a weird thing. It was like, oh, you, yeah, it's in your backyard, but you never knew that that portal existed in that space. Right, so you've right. Been That's to, holy weird is right over there. <laughs> yeah, but it's like this whole other portal. You know, you know, it opens up, and there's that in there. I never knew it was there. Yeah, and it's cool. Oh my god. Well, so look, I know you got to go, but I want to ask you one quick question. Um, yeah. My shows normally focused quite a bit on the artist's journey and mental health and sort of how you deal with, you know, success or overcoming or, you know, touring or all these little things, right? A little, a little nugget to, for the audience. Okay. And, and, you know, I know I've said this enough today, but, you know, you're a great player, you're a great stage performer, you have great presence, and you always seem happy. And I know there's no human in the world that's happy all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. and I, 
so I'm curious, how do you keep yourself aligned out on the road or, or how do you keep from getting the doldrums when you're home? Uh, oh yeah. Well, oh, um, oh yeah. It, 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 well, um, <laughs> uh, uh -oh. yeah. well, no, it's, it is interesting. I mean, it is always, um, I, it is a little bit of a challenge always to, to stay balanced and centered and everybody's got their own. I'm just, when I'm, as I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about my family and, and, uh, and I'm thinking about my tour mates. Um, I'm not really sure how, how successful they might think I am at it. I don't know. Uh, but I do try to, um, you know, I guess it's all a lot of cliche stuff nowadays. It's like, um, you know, just uh, try to, um, you know, get sleep and just take care of myself as, right. you know, I try to stay physically active, try to stay in balance and, um, you know, but I'm not always so good at it. And, um, there's time, but I'm just very, I'm also very, very lucky. I've got, um, I've been with the same woman now, the same person for millions of years, 20 years. So at 20 plus years and, um, yeah. And, uh, and I'm very lucky that I have someone that is uh, always um, on my team and she pushes back when I'm deluded and, um, and I, and she does it, um, you know, fairly, she's always very fair. And uh, so I can, I'm very lucky to have that. Um, yeah. And then um and then, yeah, and then in terms of the people I play music with, I'm very lucky that they're, you know, at this point of the game, um, I'm now with a group of people that um, really are there for um, um, reasons that all make a lot of sense to me. And, um, and so whatever, we're all just really tolerant of each other and, so people put up with my crap and I put up with their crap and, um, and no one's really crazier than the next person and um, seems to be, you know, so whatever that's, those are, uh, so I guess I would say I, 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 I mostly just tribute um, my sanity to sane environments. You know? <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll tell you, man, you, you come into the band is like bringing smoked paprika. You know what I mean? You're just, you're just a new part of the recipe uh, and, and I adore it. And I'm so grateful that you were here today. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use that. I'm the smoked paprika of the band. You, what is that? Or you're going to use I'm that? Gonna, I'm going to use that. Yeah, please do. I'll, I'll title that. That'll be the title of the show. <laughs> smoked paprika makes them, makes the milk taste better. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, uh, look, man, you're fantastic. Thanks for giving me some time today. I, I wish nothing but the best for you. A, a massive 2023, the new record, Bad Mood Rising, the Melvins, all the good things, man. You're a freaking badass, and thank you so much for being here, brother. Thank you. It was really nice, Rob. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Bye.